Good afternoon. I'm Jacques Delisle. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China here at the University of Pennsylvania. And I would like to welcome you to the third installment of our six webinars on the Penn Project on the Future of US-China Relations. For those of you who've been with us the last couple of weeks, this uh, opening spiel will be familiar to you, but I'm going to give it anyway for people who may have tuned in uh, for this one. Of my co-organizers, Nason Makbubi, a research scholar here at the center, and Avery Goldstein, my predecessor as director of the center and professor of political science here at Penn. I want to welcome you uh, to today's session, which will focus on research, education, and academic freedom issues in U.S.-China relations. Uh, we have another all-star lineup today to address those issues. Uh, and let me just give a brief introduction again of the project before turning it over to Nason, who will uh, be the moderator for today's panel and will introduce the panelists. The idea behind this project is that we are at something of an inflection point and a moment of indeed crisis in U.S.-China relations. For the first 40 years following the normalization of relations between the United States and the People's Republic, the basic tone, despite some ups and downs, some significant setbacks, was one of engagement. Uh, and it was a relatively uh, positive uh, relationship and certainly not one that had reached a level of rivalry. We now are in an era when constructive engagement is uh, widely uh, criticized and when that consensus has given way to a consensus in favor of something uh, more strong, more hardline, more uh, rivalrous in an engagement with China, but a great disagreement about what exactly uh, that should take, how far one should go. These issues become all the more fraught as the U.S. heads into a presidential election season where many people are already voting uh, and where China issues, although not central to the campaigns, uh, are lurking around the edges and occasionally come fully into view. One of the other things, in addition to the general downward trajectory in recent years in U.S.-China relations or U.S. policy toward China, uh, is an appreciation of just how complex and multifaceted the relationship has become over four decades. Uh, there are those who worry about a new Cold War, but there are profound distinctions really rooted to a great degree, not only in 40 years of relatively positive relations, but in the creation of a huge number of social, economic, security, and other kinds of ties. The idea of this project was to bring together mostly younger generation scholars uh, who have grown up in a field of Chinese studies or the study of China and US-China relations, where uh, the earlier generations had kind of laid the foundation and people were able to develop more depth in specific areas in this complex relationship. So what this uh, project does, organized under six panels with 20 individual papers, each with their own distinctive characteristics, is try to plumb some of the depths of those aspects of the relationship to bring the academic depth that the younger generation of scholars has in those areas to these questions and to generate from them policy relevant ideas and prescriptions. So we're trying to hit that sweet spot between uh, think tank ideas with the shelf life of yogurt uh, and academic uh, projects which only fellow academics love to read. And I think as you'll see from today's papers and the papers from the last two weeks and from the three weeks ahead, uh, we've done a pretty darn good job of that. So before I turn it over to Nason and eat up any more time that is better used dealing with substantive issues on the table today, I just wanna thank those who have made this possible. Uh, financially, that's the China Research and Engagement Fund for the Penn Provost Office, Penn Global. Uh, the Henry Luce Foundation, which has given a generous grant as well. And we've also uh, partnered with the Foreign Policy Research Institute and the Next 40 a project that Kaiser Guo operates. It's, it's a part of the ancestral history of this particular project. A couple of ground rules as we get going here. Uh, this is in a webinar format. Uh, so the way to raise your questions is to put them in written form, type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I also ask that you keep an eye on the chat box. You won't, as a participant, as a spectator, uh, audience member, be able to, to put things into the chat box, but there will be announcements uh, that come out from uh, that, uh, that source, uh, instructions about how to submit questions, about how to get more information about our projects, which also reminds me to thank Yuan Yan Zhang, the Associate Director at our Center, and Amanda Morrison, uh, who are behind the scenes making this all possible. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Nason. Well, thank you, Jacques, and welcome everyone to today's discussion focused on the theme of research, education, and academic freedom in U.S.-China relations. Uh, close observers of this project may have noted that the theme for this grouping of policy papers by our authors, Mary Gallagher, Rory Truex, and Maggie Lewis, used to be society and values, which was somewhat clunky language, that's why we changed it, but it was meant to highlight the dilemmas of how to preserve, protect, and promote liberal values whilst pursuing people-to-people -people and other societal exchanges between the U.S. and China. A case in point for that kind of deliberation was provided by the reaction to Houston Rockets GM Daryl Morey's tweet uh, 
in support of the Hong Kong protesters almost exactly one year ago today. And of course, we could list numerous other examples as well. The papers we commissioned along these lines from the all-star team you're about to hear from ended up focusing attention on questions of research and academic exchange, which reflects not only the particular interests of these authors, but also more broadly that this particular area is quite likely the most significant one for working out the issues we were thinking about under the society and values rubric. And of course, this is a hugely appropriate topic for us as the Center for the Study of Contemporary China to sponsor as an academic unit ourselves. But I give you all this background in order to underscore the larger issues having to do with the preservation and the promotion of liberal values that surround our discussion today. And we could not have a better group to highlight for you today, each one of them a major scholar of Chinese politics or law on its own terms, who has also been very active in writing about the issues of US-China relations that are the subject of today's panel and our project as a whole. In the interest of time, I will not introduce them to you in full now. You can read their bios on our project website, uh, where again, you can find the policy papers upon which their comments today are based. But for now, let me just briefly welcome all three. We have Mary Gallagher, the Amy and Alan Lowenstein Professor in Democracy, Democratization and Human Rights at the University of Michigan, where she is also the director of the International Institute. We have Rory Truex, assistant professor in the Department of Politics and School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University, and one of the principal co-authors of a major statement issued over the summer on how to teach China now in the aftermath of the new national security law for Hong Kong and other steps taken by the Chinese government. And we have Maggie Lewis, professor of law at Seton Hall University, member of the Council on Foreign Relations, who joins us today from Taipei, where she's visiting at the Academia Sinica. Welcome to you all. So as the previous webinars have proceeded, we will first have a segment of time where I will be in dialogue with our three panelists, and then we'll open it up uh, to questions uh, from all of you who are attending today. Remember again that you can submit your questions through the Q&A function. Uh, I'll be scanning that when we reach that point in the program and then posing those questions to the panelists. Because the three papers here are so closely connected in terms of themes, I do want to get them all out in front of you early. So instead of uh, going through each paper one by one extensively, I'm going to pose a series of questions to all three of them and get all the themes out uh, collectively. And, and the first question that I want to pose, and I'll start by posing it to Mary, is simply to set the scene for our audience. Um, what is the area that you've written about for our project under the title of Corporatist Organization in a Pluralist Setting, the Challenges of Educational Collaboration and Exchange with the PRC? Thanks, Nathan. Uh, I want to just make four points about the memo that I wrote today and uh, to give people some background so that they can then dive into the, the, the broader part of the paper. The, um, the main focus of my paper is that to make the point to both US government as well as university administrators, that the challenge that comes from collaboration with the, with the, the PRC is not due to individual students or scholars. They emanate from the organizational forms and the tactics used by the Chinese Communist Party to extend influence abroad, to manage Chinese citizens when they are overseas, and to suppress a discussion of topics that put the CCP in negative light. Uh, so the paper gives sort of a back behind the scenes account of what are these organizations and what are these tactics that facilitate that. And I argue that those things are in violate basic principles of the United States educational system, as well as our pluralist organization of civil society and how we interact as groups and also as individuals. Uh, these tactics also diminish Chinese students and scholars own enjoyment of academic freedom and freedom of expression while they're in the United States. And they increase the potential for coercion and constraints on the freedom of expression for both the United States mm -hmm. students and scholars as well as people from China. The paper also argues that in order to constrain and mitigate these challenges, the American institutions of higher education should do 
should constrain them through enhanced or, uh, enforcement of our own principles and our own pluralist modes of organization. And that the goal of any of these restrictions should be to protect our comparative advantage in freedom of expression, association, and academic freedom. And I say that partly because another, the last point in the paper is that we should use this principle or strategy of reciprocity, which has been mentioned uh, in, the, in, in recent years as another way to deal with China, which is to become more like China, that we should try to reject uh, a strategy of reciprocity as much as possible uh, because they have, uh, reciprocity has the perverse effect of making our own institutions more like the PRCs, which is something we want to avoid. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Mary. Let's, let's move to Rory and, and ask him the same question. So just set the scene for our audience about what you've written about for the project under the title of Addressing the China Challenge for American Universities. Thank you, Nathan, and thank you, Jacques and Avery for including me in the project. Um, so I wrote about uh, the issue of collaboration between US universities and researchers and Chinese universities and researchers in the area of STEM. And what we've seen in the last few years um, from the US government and members of the Trump administration in particular is increasing concern uh, that the US system of science, the open science model is too vulnerable and uh, the current equilibrium is not to the, to the benefit of the United States and actually China is gaining uh, unfair benefits from our system of science. And I think what's important in terms of setting the stage is that there's actually three separate issues here um, to unpack and they're often conflated, but it is helpful to think of them um, separately. The first is that uh, the, the issue that's been articulated is the Chinese government is backing economic uh, espionage and other forms of intelligence collection at U.S. universities and companies. But uh, for our purposes, we're going to speak uh, about U.S. universities. Um, and the key fi feature of this is that the intelligence collection is by so-called non-traditional collectors, so namely students, researchers, professors, and so forth. Maggie is, is the real expert on this issue, and she's going to speak on it in more detail. Um, but that's the, that's the concern that's been raised by the U.S. government. The second one is what we would call conflict of interest or inappropriate relationships between U.S. researchers and Chinese institutions. Um, so people receiving uh, salaries from Chinese uh, firms or universities. And these relationships are not problematic in themselves, but they could be precursors to the transfer of technology that the U.S. government would feel would be inappropriate. And then the third issue, which is often conflated with the first two, is that there's a, a concern about human capital outflow um, from the U.S. back to China. So you'll hear the phrases like, well, we are training their scientists. Chinese students are coming here, benefiting from U.S. PhD institutions and other, other forms of, of um, education, and then returning to China uh, and using that knowledge and that training to benefit the Chinese government at the expense of the United States. And so those are the three issues that have been articulated, and hopefully in the panel today we'll talk about how serious these issues are and, and what are some appropriate policies to deal with them and what are some, some le less productive ways to deal with them. Thanks. Great, thank you, Rory. Um, so now let's move to Maggie. Uh, and again, posing the same question to Maggie, uh, set the scene for our audience. What is uh, the scene that you've uh, addressed in your paper for the project on the role of criminal law in promoting innovation? Thanks, Nason, and thanks to the whole Penn team. It's really been a pleasure to be involved in this ongoing project. So I, I come at this as a lawyer and as a law professor, and, and I'm particularly interested in what is the role of criminal law, because when we're looking at the US-China relationship, there's been this increasing emphasis on national security, that there is a China threat or even a Chinese threat as it's somehow sometimes termed. And uh, yes, national security is of course hugely important. And there are people who are connected to the PRC party state who have violated US laws, stolen intellectual property. However, uh, I do worry about the over-securitization of the relationship and, and criminal law being overused. Now, we, this is not new to the Trump administration. We saw moves under the Obama administration to start um, actually indicting sort of members of the PLA or people connected with the Chinese military involved in hacking, increased use of economic espionage, which is a trade secret theft, but the intended beneficiary is a foreign government or a uh, entity closely connected with that government. So it's got this trade secret theft plus foreign threat element to it. But what we've seen, um, and since almost exactly two years, because it was in November 1st, 2018, 
that then Attorney General Jeff Sessions, so long ago, stood up and announced that the Department of Justice was starting what was called a China Initiative. And this was going to be an enhancing, coalescing of resources to address these cases of intellectual property theft um, that were tied to China. Um, at the time, it was more focused, it seemed, on the IP theft, but it's expanded to what, what Rory was talking about, of these sort of compromised relationships. People who have connections to Chinese universities or other entities have failed to disclose them, for example, on a federal grant form, so they are um, then find themselves charged for false statements, uh, fraud of various types, like wire fraud because of receiving payments, and we've seen an increase in those kinds of cases. Um, I've written at length in one of those academic papers with hundreds of footnotes about why I think it's problematic the way China is discussed because it's too broad and sweeps in people because of their nationality, even their ethnicity, and then also there's concerns sort of under criminal law theory. But what I want to emphasize here and I'm really stepping back is what is the role of criminal law in creating an environment that is good for research and education and innovation? And criminal law has a role. It should be there, but it should not be there at the forefront. And I really worry now about over deterrence, that we have it so people are scared about having connectivity, if having engagement with China, because it's putting them under uh, the microscope. And in particular, people who don't look like me, but are ethnically Chinese, um, have PRC nationality, and I've been doing work with some of the Asian American groups and other advocacy organizations, and that stigmatization is real. Uh, and so the way I was sort of thinking about this um, when I was uh, walking around Taipei today, um, because it is now, it is late, uh, but uh, was there's a, there's a classic Saturday Night Live skit about um, more cowbell and this idea that the blue oyster cult was recording Don't Fear the Reaper, which does have a cowbell subtly in the background throughout. But you have Will Farrell with Christopher Walken being told more cowbell, more cowbell, until all you hear is the cowbell. And I feel like that's what's happening with criminal law, that instead of being the backstop, what you use when grant reporting requirements and administrative penalties aren't working, criminal law is being put front and center. And you know, no, you don't want more cowbell and I don't want more criminal law. It should be used in a more prudent and judicious manner. Well, thank you, Maggie, for that extremely helpful analogy. I think we can say that the whole point of the project across the board is to reduce cowbell and to have uh, more precision in our analysis. Uh, so that's great. And if you haven't seen the skit, you should look it up. It's a funny one. Um, so that's great. We have, we have a great set of ideas here. And uh, as we go through a few more rounds, I think hopefully we're going to have more and more dialogue between uh, our authors. Um, why don't I go back to Mary first? And, and try to dig a little bit more into the details, the granularity of the problem you see. And, and get you to really uh, tell us more about why institutions like Confucius Institutes, which um, you know, the University of Michigan does not have uh, for reasons that uh, of course you are very well aware. And um, you know, Chinese student and scholars associations, what is really the problem that they are posing to uh, university life and, and I want to add a second question. Um, your paper is focused on American universities and Chinese uh, entities operating within American universities. But I want to ask if you think there's a corollary discussion in China. Um, could there be a corollary discussion where uh, Chinese administrators would say, we don't want to have the Schwarzman College on Tsinghua University campus, or we don't want to have NYU having a joint uh, venture in Shanghai or across the board, across all the other things. So how do you differentiate the problem that you're seeing, if you do differentiate the problem you're seeing here in American universities from what Chinese counterparts might perceive um, in China? Thanks, Nathan. Um, well, I know in the paper, just as a footnote, that I don't really talk about the um, the, the expansion of uh, joint venture, what you might call joint venture universities in China, like uh, Duke or NYU um, or many in Nottingham and Ningbo, many others, or pr programs like Schwarzman and the Yenqing program um, in Beijing, partly because uh, the, the point of the paper is to show how Chinese, really Chinese Communist Party organizations operate through organizations like the CI, like Confucius Institutes, or like CSSAs in some, in some cases, 
um, through a, um, an affiliation with a foreign university and an embedding um, of those organizations within American universities. And I think that is, is particularly troublesome and particularly um, insidious for the climate of academic freedom and freedom of expression, not just for, for people who are from the PRC, but particularly for, from, for students who are from the PRC, but more generally for programming on American campuses in relation to China. And the paper goes through some details about how the organizations are set up, how they have ties and, and, and really um, guidance from uh, organizations, either through the consulates and embassies or through the Ministry of Education and the United Front Work Department. So the paper is a little bit in the weeds about that, but I think it's super important for um, university administrators to understand the, the, those, the, the way in which the organizations function. Uh, for, for universities, foreign universities that are operating in China, I think they need, they are operating in that environment, right? And it is, of course, the, the right of the Chinese government to manage and control their universities as they see fit, which they do. Um, and the, the environment is completely different. So I think I, I would really separate those issues. Um, I think they're very, very separate. This issue is, my memo is really about how organizations that exist on American campuses that have ties to the Chinese Communist Party need to be constrained and mitigated. On the other hand, I'm not saying in the paper that the Chinese government should never fund things or Confucius Institutes should not exist. I'm, I'm really focusing on how they're organized and how they're embedded within American universities. And Mary, if I can come back to you, so on, let's say Confucius Institutes in particular, what's the worst thing that Confucius Institutes could do on an American university campus? Like what's the worst case scenario that's driving your concern? Chinese, Confucius Institutes, generally speaking, um, do either language training or some kind of arts and culture programming on American campuses and to some degree also in K through 12 um, institutions in, in the United States and many other places around the world. Um, the programming and the teaching is vetted by the Ministry of Education and it is, I think, um, uh, there's a lot of um, self-censorship and um, perhaps even direct censorship, although that's much more difficult to prove, um, over content or programming that puts the PRC in a negative light. Uh, and that means, of course, on American campuses that do not have other units that deliver programming on China or other units that teach Chinese, that is going to be the only game in town. So again, going back to this notion of pluralism versus a more kind of closed corporatist system, we want to embrace the kind of pluralism on American campuses. We want to have diversity of views. We want to have diversity of programming. And when um, these organizations dominate, either they dominate Chinese students as the main in association, or they dominate language training and programming, that can be very, very bad for the atmosphere. Great. So let's let's put Rory back on the hot seat. Um, so Rory, you've written about the concern that scientific collaboration between American and Chinese citizens um, can strengthen technological innovation in China, um, and that this is an area that we're particularly concerned when it has national security and military implications. But you've also written about how we have an open science culture here in the United States. And so I guess how would you tell us the, the real issues that are driving the concern um, in your paper. You know, what kinds of help to Chinese technological innovation are particularly problematic from your point of view, given that we do have this open scientific culture in the United States that um, is partly strengthened by it being open um, and taking in lots of different inputs and producing goods for, for uh, others around the world. I think the concern, I, I think it's important for, for us all in, in the academic community to not just bury our heads in the sand about this. And I think there's a tendency uh, for some to do so. Um, there are certain, there is research conducted on US campuses that has real national security implications. And one of the issues that is that a lot of technology um, is what we would call dual use technology. It's, it's um, the research is so broad, it's, it's sometimes referred to as basic research. Um, but that the, the, there are implications and applications that could have um, national, security, national security implications. So once you start going down that, 
path, you know, something like AI, artificial intelligence, um, clearly has national security implications, but also has, um, you know, basic theoretical uh, research that's being done and so forth. So there's always this question of a lot of the science that, that's being done today could potentially be used um, in a military setting. So the question is, what do we do about it? And I would say the, the approach of many in the Trump administration has been twofold. The first is to try to get Chinese students out of the U.S. system in many different ways. And we've seen various forms uh, of visa bans or basically just barriers uh, put up or proposed to be put up in the last couple of years. The Secure Campus Act, uh, which doesn't look like that will pass, but that was proposed by Tom Cotton, proposes to ban all Chinese students in STEM. Uh, we've seen proposals to uh, limit visas to four years, which would effectively prevent a student from doing a five-year PhD, which is the length of most PhDs. We've now seen calls to not allow anybody with any ties to the Chinese Communist Party to ultimately assimilate into the United States and gain, gain citizenship. And so that's kind of prong one of the Trump administration is to try to get Chinese students out. Uh, and then the, the prong two, which is again, Maggie's area of expertise, is the criminal side and to try to increase monitoring uh, of Chinese students and researchers and try to identify problematic relationships, which in and of itself, um, maybe doesn't sound too bad, but the question is, we don't really know the scope and scale of the problem. And what has happened is we've created a, a hostile environment for anybody who is Chinese. And the overall thrust of my paper is that all of these measures, in my opinion, constitute an overcorrection. Um, and what we've done, we, we need in the United States citizens from China to come and con to contribute to our, our universities and our research apparatus. And by creating this hostile climate, we are actually helping the Chinese government. If I were the Chinese government, I would be rooting for the Secure Campus Act to pass because that's going to help them with their brain drain problem. Well, that's a great segue to Maggie, um, because I think there's a lot of ways in which Maggie's paper, uh, I think, builds off of that kind of a point. Um, but in sort of setting it up for you, Maggie, Rory does identify some real things to be worried about. Um, and so maybe you could also speak to that because you really have to navigate this line between acknowledging concerns, but then suggesting that, as you said, the response has too much cowbell, which I think is also what Rory was just suggesting. So that seems a very subtle point to make and our policy um, making processes aren't always subtle. So how do you do both? How do you both identify the, the real concern cabinet and then suggest a more tailored approach to um, addressing it. And a fundamental issue is that I don't think the government has articulated what the concern is. So what is it that we are trying to protect? Because it's not just, you know, even um, intellectual property that has clear dual use that you say, yes, maybe it can be used in your cell phone, but it also can be used in military technology and, and we see how it can be used. We're increasingly seeing being intellectual property violations that traditionally would be dealt with in, in civil court. The company that says you, to another company, you stole our stuff, we're going to sue you, we're going to take your money. But to, to take it into the criminal sphere, that's a whole nother level. That's saying not only was the company that owned the IP harmed, but society was harmed. So I don't think we've done enough to sort of explain, okay, corn seeds, corn seeds have been an issue under the China initiative. Um, that's not military, but it is important to the US economy. So how are we defining intellectual property and other assets that are a concern? Also from whom are they being stolen? So what is an American company? I mean, so again, you think of the, the corn seed example, Monsanto had, seeds stolen. Um, Monsanto was then um, purchased by Bayer, a German company, of course, has large operations in the US. But a lot of the statements from the Department of Justice is we need to, you know, hold on to our American ingenuity, and we have to make sure the American companies are strong. And I don't think we've thought enough about what does it mean if you have a company like Lenovo that, you know, was Chinese, and then it bought IBM. So what is American? What is Chinese? And I don't see that nuance happening. So I know like Meg Rithmere was recently on one of these um, uh, webinars and is working on this project. And she's doing great work with um, Hao Chen on the relationship between ostensibly private companies in China and the government and the party. And we know those aren't clear buckets either, but I don't see any of that nuance really happening 
with the China initiative, and that worries me. And then finally, you know, who's stealing this stuff? You know, so you have in the threat awareness briefings that the Department of Justice is, is giving to academia and to businesses that, you know, what has China stolen? I mean, that is a direct quote, but you know, China doesn't have arms. It's, you, so you're anthropomorphizing this idea of China into something that cheats and steals. And I don't think enough thinking has gone into how much are we concerned about entities that are directly under sort of the PRC party state taking things and how much is it academia tied to the government, but some distance companies that are ostensibly private. And again, I just don't see the work being done in the government to work with the people who have the expertise on China and on science to come up with some more um, targeted and thoughtful ways of going about this work. Nathan, if, if I might just add sure. to, to what Maggie said. Um, I think the question for all of these issues, including everything Mary has spoken about, is, is really a one of scale. So we know, we know that the Chinese government is up to some shenanigans on US campuses, whether it's through CSSAs or whether there's um, pressure being put through individual students or whether there's some espionage going on. But we, we don't really quite know the scale. And if the scale is large, then it, it necessitates a larger reaction. And for the, the China initiative, um, what we know is they have about 2,000 open investigations, but those are investigations. And we know that individual field offices have been put under pressure to investigate. Uh, there's been roughly 40 to 50 arrests. Uh, of those, I think there's a little over 10 universities that have been involved. And of those 10 cases, there's maybe three or four that look like something resembling espionage. And then if you back out the denominator, which is we have roughly 100,000 Chinese citizens uh, at US universities working in STEM, that implies a, a criminality or offense rate of under one in 10,000. And so, you know, there is something going on, but is it enough to merit the kind of over, the, the kind of sweeping changes we're, we're making to how US universities work? I think that's the question. And the same question could be asked to, to Mary about, you know, we know CSSAs might be problematic, but how many of them have that relationship with the consulate that we're really worried about? How many CIs are putting forth that, that propaganda material? You know, we, we, need, we need a little bit more information on the scale. And, and let me just, if I could say something about that 2000 number, because you know, it's one of the few numbers we have and, and where that comes from is, so Christopher Ray, the director of the FBI had said um, in February of this year at, a, at CSIS at a, at a conference on the China Initiative that there were approximately a thousand open cases. And then I think it was in June in an interview, he said there's about 2000. So these are just cases that the FBI has opened. It's very, very low threshold. And, and so that tells us that the US government is putting a lot of resources behind the China initiative, that there's a lot of concern. But again, it tells us nothing about the actual prevalence of criminal behavior. And then we have a, a tremendous issue with the lack of transparency um, once these cases are being investigated, which I understand to a certain extent because that's how you do a, a quality investigation is you keep it quiet, you, you get the evidence, but it particularly because when there have been convictions, those have mostly been through plea bargains, which are not transparent as far as getting evidence out there to light. So we have a couple cases in the pipeline that appear to be going to trial, um, including the Charles Lieber case of Harbor, uh, from Harvard, and there's uh, the Tao case, which is in, uh, in Kansas. And I think we might get a little bit more information as those um, actually go and you have open trials. So I'm, I'm thrilled. We, we've got a hot and uh, very active discussion going here. Um, and the questions are coming in fast and furious in the Q&A function. Um, just to remind everyone, uh, the chat function is purposefully disabled for you. You cannot ask questions to the chat, but you can ask questions to the Q&A function. And just given the number of questions that are popping up uh, before I've even opened it up to Q&A, uh, if you have a question, I would highly recommend putting it in now. Um, but what I want to do just before we get to the Q&A is um, to just go through the policy recommendations that each of our authors has, um, has developed for the project. And, and here I really want to emphasize that this is the whole point of the project, is uh, to uh, translate the specialized research, the specialized expertise of each one of our authors into actionable policy recommendations for U.S. policymakers. And we have I think a capacious understanding of uh, U.S. policymakers. Uh, clearly, the government, and we'll see which administration will be uh, in power is it January 20th. Um, but policymakers more broadly. And so, 
let's just do a round of question on that, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So first to Mary, um, let's hear what are the actionable policy recommendations that you've developed for this project um, rooted in the concerns that you've uh, outlined earlier. And Mary, you have to unmute your microphone. You told me not to mute. Um, I just wanted to say one thing to um, Rory's uh, question about the, the kind of scope and the, the impact. So I would say one thing about um, programming and activities related to Confucius Institutes that what often happens is not clearly uh, propaganda. So measuring propaganda will be difficult. What happens instead, which is I think much more insidious, is something like the absence of certain information, the absence of certain topics. Or if, if you're on a university campus where there is both a Confucius Institute and an independent Center for Chinese Studies, the Center for Chinese Studies is going to become the anti-China organization doing the sensitive topics. And the Confucius Institute is going to become the nice China, the beautiful China, the friendly China organization. And that itself is problematic. So if you have, if you have, if it's the only game in town, then you have the absence. And then if it, it isn't, there's this, this imbalance. So, and that's very difficult, I think, to, to actually measure systematically. In terms of recommendations, I divided my recommendations into recommendations for the US government, recommendations for universities. Uh, for the US government, I think the US government should consider whether Chinese student and scholars associations with official affiliation with the Chinese embassy or consulate as recognized by their bylaws or constitution, uh, whether they constitute foreign agents and should register as such under the Foreign Agent Registration Act, which is something that's happened recently with Chinese journalists. I also argue, <laughs> as, as somebody who directed a China Center for 10 years, the US government should significantly increase funding for area studies and foreign language training and not to see foreign culture and foreign language competency only as a defense or an intelligence issue. This is something that affects our economic competitiveness. It affects our soft power. It affects our ability to do people to people exchange. I also argue, and I think uh, Maggie also made this, or maybe Rory, that the US should restore funding for the Fulbright programs in Hong Kong and China to facilitate scholarly research on China so that we actually study China and know China. I could only write this paper because I've had a Fulbright to China um, and training in Chinese language and also the global dissemination of American academic principles through, the, through, foreign, through Fulbright funded uh, Chinese researchers in the United States. And finally, and this is relation to what Maggie is writing about, overwhelmingly when I looked at the, um, the, the, the bills and the announcements from US policymakers, there's often this conflation of these two issues. I, my paper is mostly on influence operations and restrictions on free speech and academic freedom. And I'm not talking about non-traditional espionage um, and often, or intellectual property violations. And often when people talk about let's close down Confucius Institutes, things like that, they mention spying. I think there's very little evidence that I've seen that, this, that these are areas for, for where espionage or non-traditional espionage actually happen. For your um, university administrators, I argue that they should do a better job in providing foreign students with um, access to our pluralist environment, particularly around associations, and that we also need to do more to support international students, particularly students right now during COVID, um, and Asian students who are dealing with a lot of xenophobia and, and, and racist attacks. Uh, and the United States, uh, the university administrator should not delegate this work to student organizations. This, is, this should be something that universities actually do um, themselves. We should also provide incoming international students with training and workshops on academic freedom, freedom of expression, and the importance of pluralistic debate in the classroom and also during events. And we should provide um, organizers of events uh, protocol and best practices for things that are controversial or sensitive so that students and observers have the right to protest or the right to demonstrate against the speaker that they don't like, but they are not permitted to shut down events or shout down people with whom they disagree. And finally, I argue related to Confucius Institutes that university administrators should not allow Confucius Institutes to exist on American campuses to be set up within universities embedded within the university structures 
Organizations like Confucius Institutes should exist as standalone organizations with affiliations, funding, and financial expenditures made transparent through necessary tax and regulations. Thank you. So Mary, let me just um, ask you one follow-up question. So it seems like your recommendations fall into two buckets and one set of recommendations are negative vis-a-vis -vis, um, Confucius Institutes in particular, but also uh, Chinese Student and Scholars Associations rooted in your concerns about them. But then another set of recommendations are positive, wanting uh, more money for Fulbright Exchange, wanting more money from the US government for language study. And I guess my question to you is, what if you don't get the second bucket? What if that's just not on the table? You don't get the Fulbright. You don't get the funding for uh, language study. You don't get universities doing too much to reach out to international students and in particular Chinese students. So there's, that remains a negative space. Does that affect at all your recommendations in the first bucket? No, they don't affect that. The, those I think are pretty clearly related to kind of maintaining our own um, atmosphere of sort of academic freedom and free expression on campuses. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, sacrifice that for some ability, some funding um, that might be tied to um, certain constraints. Uh, I think it, I think though your question gets to something which is more serious, which is it's, it's not, my concern is not that we don't get those things, which you know, our uh, Title VI and um, FLAS, which are the two main um, US government funding resources for area studies and foreign language training at higher ed, um, they were cut by the Obama administration after the financial crisis by 40%, by $50 million. They have not been restored to the same levels prior to the financial crisis. Um, and they for sure hurt our ability to train students and to do quality programming. So my concern is not that we don't get the funding restored. My, fun, my concern is that the things that Rory was talking about, the things that Maggie is, was writing about, actually further diminish the campus environment on Amer American campuses, um, further tarnish our reputation among international students, and um, in, in a bid to sort of isolate or, or contain China, what we do is isolate ourselves. Great. And so why don't we now move to Rory? And Rory, can you tell us a little bit more about the recommendations that uh, you've developed for this project? Um, sure. And I, in, in deriving my recommendations, I wanted to start by articulating a, a set of principles uh, to help think about this issue. And so I, I want to just briefly highlight them. And then I'll talk about one or two of my, my policy ideas. In terms of the principles, I would say first, we need to policies um, the basic, basic principle of non-discrimination. So no policy should foster systematic discrimination against a population based on its ethnicity or nation of origin. Um, the second principle is that we have to recognize the importance of foreign born researchers and Chinese researchers in particular to the US economy and US universities. Um, we can't simply just say we don't, need, uh, we don't need Chinese people, we need Chinese citizens to come and, and, and we need that, that type of exchange. Um, the third, I, I think, is the most uh, important is we have to acknowledge that our model of science, open science, is inherently vulnerable with respect to plagiarism, economic espionage, and other forms of theft. Our science is open. We collaborate. We have, we have open talks. We post code. And there's no way, unless we want to classify major areas of our, of our scientific enterprise, there's no way to, to fully prevent some of the things that are happening. Uh, that we don't like. And we just have to acknowledge um, that some of this, some of the espionage might happen. And, and that doesn't mean that the model is broken. And then the fourth is that there is possibility for cooperation between the US government and, and US universities. Um, lately, there's been this uh, feeling that US universities um, need to get their act together. And if they don't, the US government is going to do it for them. I, I think there needs to be closer collaboration uh, between both sides. In terms of policies, um, one that I think is fairly straightforward is we need to enhance our disclosure system. So for those who are less familiar, most faculty members have to disclose um, their grants and other financial relationships every year in an annual disclosure form. If you receive funding from the U.S. government, like the NSF or the NIH, NIH you'll have a separate form for them, and you'll actually have to disclose the relationships of everybody in your research team. And the, the truth about these disclosure forms is I think many faculty members view them as a nuisance. Uh, they are not standardized across institutions. It's unclear. Most universities don't even really have the capacity to look at their own disclosure forms. Uh, 
And so a lot of actually the, the cases that have been brought forth um, under the China initiative are, are about fraud uh, and the failure to disclose financial ties. That's the Charles Lieber example. And so we, I have a proposal where we should have a centralized disclosure system where all faculty members at US universities um, complete one form every year that is overseen by the NSF or some other institution in the US government. And, if, and it could potentially have an audit component. So if, if disclosure were taken more seriously and a violation of, of, of that would be a violation of research integrity, I think that could be productive. Um, the other idea that I had that's probably the most controversial is that I, I, I it's called the no dual salary rule. Um, a lot of uh, people have expressed concern about the thousand talents programs and this, these relationships. Some professors at US universities do receive salary uh, from Chinese institutions. And I personally view those relationships as problematic. I don't know how one can be a full-time professor at a university, U.S. university and also be receiving $50,000 a year, which might be on the high end, um, $50,000 a month, excuse me, in Char Charles Liebler's example, from a Chinese institution. So the, the no dual salary rules, we should just prevent no full-time employee of an American university should receive salary or substantial compensation from the government or military of or university or firm in a country of high strategic concern. Um, and that might be controversial, and, and we probably all have actually colleagues and friends that have um, that kind of relationship with a Chinese counterpart, but it's something to think through. At the very minimum, I think we need to be better about disclosing those relationships, and people need to be open about those relationships when they exist. I'll leave it there. I have a couple other ideas, but I, I don't want to take up too much time. Well, Roy, let me just ask you one quick follow-up, which is I think you have a lot of very concrete uh, measured ideas. Um, you know, some may be slightly more controversial than others. Like you said, the no dual salary rule might get more pushback, but I, I can't imagine you'd have much opposition to the idea of a centralized disclosure and something that's cleaner and simpler for people to deal with. But I want to ask you about a broader principle. You said that in general, you want to see more cooperation between the U.S. government and uh, U.S. universities. And I just wonder if you have any concerns, given that universities are driven by a very particular set of academic values that are not necessarily the way that people within, you know, the relevant government departments are thinking about things. And do you worry at all about any um, pushback against what are the values that drive the work that we all do in the university setting if there's too much cooperation? There can never be too much cooperation, Nathan. I, I, I would just say what I worry about is people who have no background in science, no background in academia, legislating, no background in China, and who are bashing China for political reasons, legislating how universities should behave. That's what I worry about. And that's what we're seeing with Tom Cotton and others, uh, uh, Josh Hawley, I forget, Josh, John, Josh, Joshua Hawley, right? Um, you know, the, they're, they're, they're legislating about how universities should behave, but they aren't understanding universities. And so we need to preserve university self-governance, but we also can't just say, stay out, this is our business. And so there needs to be some trust building exercises between US universities, the law enforcement community, the intelligence community, the executive branch. And so I, I do think closer collaboration would be helpful. I'm not, I'm not terribly worried that that would somehow backfire. Okay, Maggie, tell us about your recommendations. Yeah, and I, I need to start by saying none of this is easy. It's not like if we just do X, Y, Z, this problem is going to go away. And it's hard. And I, and I do appreciate the hardworking men and women in the Department of Justice and other parts of our government who are, are trying to address these issues because it is hard. But I, I think we can do a better job. And, and so just going off of Rory's point that I worry that people who have a real national security focus are driving the bus. You know, they're the ones in front here. And, and so, for example, uh, John Demers, who's the Assistant Attorney General for National Security, recently um, gave an hour-long talk for USC. And I appreciate the outreach and that he went on and went to talk to an academic audience. But when asked, you know, well, what are the sort of skills or what are you looking for, you know, for the people to help you with this project? He mentioned people who knew about computers, who could take information about intellectual property and be able to explain it to a non-technical audience. And, but no mention of people who had Chinese language abilities, understanding China as a place, area studies, scientific community. And so one thing I really think is so important is that the Department of Justice has emphasized that they're doing more outreach, that they're going out, but most of that outreach seems to be going to universities to either explain what they see as the threat, these threat awareness briefings, 
or asking and or asking for information about who is on the campuses. And I, there's outreach, but I don't see the Department of Justice bringing in people with expertise to help them with their work. So I think we need to not just have outreach, but bringing in of that expertise. Some other things to think about in addition to this um, um, greater collaboration, just ditch the name China Initiative. Um, that's easy to do. It's a necessary but insufficient step. But I really do think that it's fundamentally discriminatory when you say we're going after China. China is the problem. Rather, we need to think about what are the assets we're going to protect, whether it's being stolen from people in Canada or China, right? But yes, more resources will be put towards China. But to put those blinders on and say that is what we're looking at, I think is inherently problematic. Um, I also think that we do need to invest more in, um, in, in not just China training area studies, but investment in innovation in the United States. Because the other thing about intellectual property theft is you don't stay ahead by protecting the IP you have today. That's not going to take you very far. You have to continuously innovate to create even better IP that people want to steal even more, right? So if we're not doing that work, if we're not creating the environment that brings that inflow of talent that Rory was talking about from other countries and, and also generates local talent. I mean, I think every, yeah, everyone on this, all three speakers, we have kids, you know, we're trying to educate them so that they are helping the US economy in the future. It shouldn't just be about bringing people in. We also need to invest in the American education system. And last, but certainly not least, I really think there's an issue with just bias. And, and part of this in the Trump administration, of course, is explicit bias. We saw that in the debate with the China plague. We've heard Kung flu. So there is explicit bias that's at work. But I, I think that a, a bigger issue for the people who are really, you know, quality law enforcement and um, and you know, prosecutors, people working for the FBI, is not necessarily explicit bias, but implicit bias. That um, they, we've seen the American Bar Association and other organizations do great work about how we constantly are making decisions, and this happens with prosecutors too, that you're not even realizing. So I keep hearing assurances from the Department of Justice that they're they're going after behaviors, not characteristics, and that they're very sensitive to do this in a non-discriminatory manner. But the reality is, is that the bias mitigation training was briefly introduced under Obama. It was ended under Trump. So telling me you are not biased does not convince me that you are not biased. And that's nothing about anything about these individuals in particular. It's simply because they're human beings. Great. So we still have a good amount of time to start taking questions from the audience. Again, they're coming in fast and furious in the Q&A function. So please uh, continue to put them there and I'll do my best to jump around and, and get all the questions out to the panelists. I, the first question that I want to highlight um, kind of builds, I think, off of what Maggie uh, just said at the end of her comment. So I think I want to pose this question to Maggie. Um, first, and then if Rory and Mary want to weigh in, uh, they're welcome to. Otherwise, we'll move on. So Maggie, this comes from uh, a, a very uh, prominent Chinese professor um, who writes, would the CCP threat, quote, would the, quote, CCP threat instead of, quote, Chinese threat or, quote, China threat be a more accurate labeling? Um, the questioner asks, it seems that a clear definition on the threat from legal perspective would be better. Uh, and then she also thanks us all for this great discussion. So I, I tend to use PRC party state in, in my writing more and more because, you know, I, those, you know, anyone who works with China know when you just speak of the government, you're leaving off this, this huge, you know, important whole, you know, the party has its own structure. It's not just that everyone in the government is a party member, everyone of importance. There's actually you know, what, who, what Xi Jinping's most important role is heading the party, not, not the government. So I think that we do need to think about um, rectifying names and terminology. And it's been interesting. So, for example, Christopher Ray, head of the FBI director, he gave a talk several months ago, and it was about the China threat. That was the title. But this talk this summer had a much longer title and said, like, the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party. 
Um, but then Pompeo gave a speech and it was about communist China, right? And, and there's, that was very intentional. It wasn't just like, you know, let's throw in communists. And that worries me that we get this, the communist gets put out there when um, that harkens back to a point in US history that I certainly don't want us to revisit. So yes, we do need to think about terminology. It matters. But you know, I, I don't think it's um, sufficient to say, well, what if we just say it's about the party? Because even that, you know, there's 90 million party members. They have a whole different, you know, mix of motives about why they're a party member, how active they are. And then you start creating this dichotomy of there's like the party and then the people. And, and I think we've seen that, for example, in some of Pottinger's speeches and that there's these, all these Chinese people are just waiting to rise up, but they're being held back down by the party. And these binaries are just too simplistic. So that worries me too, that we're sort of treating it like there are these clear buckets and, and that's just not the case. Mary, go ahead. Um, I, I agree with Maggie completely that this is a kind of hard issue and it's not clear cut. Um, in my paper, I do try to kind of spell out the way in which oversight over Chinese uh, students and scholars overseas, as well as over things like the Confucius Institutes, have been brought in much more clearly under the party um, since Xi Jinping took office. So I do think that it's right uh, Professor Sun is right to make that distinction. Um, but the, the US government and I think US policy will really struggle to make that distinction because it's actually a very hard one to make. Um, but in going just the, the point that I make in the paper about reciprocity, that reciprocity is dangerous just in this regard. So for example, in one of Christopher Ray's speeches a couple of, I think it was last year, he talked about a whole of society approach. China has a whole of society approach in collecting uh, over information overseas, and we need to adopt a similar approach in order to combat that. And that means exactly the things that Rory is talking about. We need to surveil each other. We need to report on each other. We do not want to go down that road. That road is a dead end. And it's actually the reason why we attract so many Chinese students and scholars to the U.S., because they can avoid that environment. So I really think it's a hard issue, but um, I do think it's, you know, it's a good one to discuss because we do want to make that distinction as much as we can. Well, so the next question, I think I'm going to pose this to all of you, um, and maybe uh, Rory can go first uh, since he didn't uh, get a chance in the last round. Uh, this is a question from Sophie Richardson from Human Rights Watch, who uh, I'm identifying because she's one of the uh, senior uh, advisors to our project. And so we're thrilled that um, she's involved with the project and also on this webinar. So uh, Sophie uh, writes, um, to riff on Maggie's cowbell analogy, uh, we can hear loud ringing around espionage, national security, tech transfer, and those kinds of concerns. Do you think, three of you, that there is comparable slash adequate slash appropriate ringing with respect to the ways that students and scholars of and from China are constrained. Um, thank you to Sophie for that question. Um, and I, I think what I would like to see is that we stop, there's a tendency to vilify Chinese students. Um, you know, either they are stealing technology or they are, um, you know, protesting at events about Xinjiang or Hong Kong. They're, they're you know, at the beck and call of the Chinese government and they're being influenced. And there's this narrative that um, the students themselves are, are agents of the Chinese government or under pressure from the Chinese government. And so I think we need to shift that narrative um, and think about the students as, as people that we need to help protect. Um, we, we have wonderful students coming from China. They are under a lot of pressure. Many of them are here because they wanna learn a different way of thinking. And so how can we think about um, the pressures they face and if it's coming from a CSSA or just something more informal, um, but the, the relationships that they have um, with the Chinese government, how can we help protect them? And that's you know, what a lot of our discussion this past summer about teaching um, on Zoom and in the age of the national security law, and how can we protect our Chinese students and ensure that when you go to university in Ann Arbor, it doesn't feel like you're going to university in Beijing. And so I would, I would like to see us really fundamentally shift our discussion and, and really acknowledge uh, it is difficult to be a Chinese student in the United States right now. It is extremely difficult. You are under pressure from a hyper repressive authoritarian government at home. And now you are going to a society which you thought would welcome you, but now you're being vilified. 
um, and facing discrimination on a daily basis. And so we need to be sympathizing and empathizing with those students. And um, I would like to see, I, I'm bad with analogies, but I would like to see more cowbells about that. I'll end, I'll end there. Mary, Maggie, do you want to add to that? I'll just, um, yeah, no, and I, I, yeah, now, now we're all, I, I, we're going to have so many, we're going to think of more bell analogies, but I, I think that um, I, overall, I want to see more individuation. And by that, I mean, I feel like we get these caricatures and these, these tropes that, you know, the, the sneaky Chinese scientist who's stealing Tappy the robot's arm from T-Mobile or something, and then, or the, you know, that, all Chinese students are compromised, so they can't get, um, even if they become U.S. citizens, whatever, they can't get security clearances because having family in China means you're just going to be dinged because there's too much leverage over you. And it's, and it's hard to make individual determinations, but the more we go down this sort of risk assessment model and an actuarial model, and I think of that like with criminal justice and bail reform, well, if we can just figure out who are the risky bets that we can, um, that we have to keep behind bars before trial and who based on this awesome algorithm we know we can let out with less risk. When we start applying that kind of model to um, Chinese citizens in the US and people of Chinese ethnicity, it makes it so you take away their individuality and you treat them more based on this risk assessment. And that's really worrisome. And then you add on, you get these tropes. I just watched uh, the FBI put out another threat awareness film. Uh, this one called the Nevernight Connection, and it's about um, it's based on a true story, but very loosely, and it dramatizes it has it's a dramatization of an American guy who gets paid fifteen hundred dollars and a plane ticket to Shanghai to give um, information that is somewhat classified. It turns out, but then along the way, he meets like the sexy barmaid and the the like slick. Um, PLA operative. And so you get this too, which is not helping because it feeds a lot of these stereotypes. And that's purposely being shown by the FBI to people who they see as being vulnerable to being compromised. Well, if, if Mary doesn't want to join in, I, I'll ask next a, a connected question. Um, uh, and this is actually from Bob Cap, uh, the former and longtime president of the US-China Business Council, which I think is sort of the corollary in some ways to Sophie's question. Um, and maybe, uh, Mary, if you want, you can get the first crack at this. So, so Bob writes, uh, the question is this, how can any of us who seek to preserve some sort of respectful and civil and productive dialogue with Chinese counterparts even get to first base if we operate on the understanding that everyone we, we deal with is first and foremost locked into a CCP authority structure that controls his or her every thought as he or she engages with us. In that case, why bother? That seems to be the implication of much of the messaging from the, um, uh, the national security hardliners in the Trump administration. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with that statement. I think that that's the, um, the counterproductiveness of the current policy, which I think is really unfortunate. And it will have long-term implications for U.S. higher ed and for U.S. innovation, because um, the 350,000 Chinese students who come here to search to get a degree, either a under, overwhelmingly, I think still now undergraduate degree, um, their parents are making a decision usually when they're in elementary school, if, this, if their child is probably gonna study overseas. And they have lots of places to choose from. Uh, they have Canada, they have the UK. If, they're, if they want English, you know, they have Australia. They have lots of places where they could go. They could stay in China. Um, the people who, search out a foreign a degree in a in a foreign country for for their for their university degree are really often exceptional students and we absolutely do not want to make them feel unwelcome and my paper was trying to demonstrate there are ways in which these organizations on american campuses can in can can unduly affect them and make uh, american campuses seem less safe can make american campuses seem less open and that we need to um, embrace them as well as to facilitate their inclusion into our campus environment and to protect uh, that environment at all costs because it is one of the most important parts of American soft power. 
Well, why don't we have so many questions? So I'm, I'm happy to keep going down the list. Um, so uh, here's a question that I think maybe Rory could take the first crack at. Uh, this is from Tom Gold at Berkeley. Um, and he asks, are there good models of universities, are there good models existent already of universities that have brought faculty researchers from STEM and social science humanities together to share information and formulate policies? Because he says the common refrain, you know, someone like Tom who knows universities very well is, oh, they're all feudal kingdoms and they'd never communicate, so we can't even try. Um, that's a great question. And I, I'm less familiar with, um you know, other universities and the kinds of activities that are going on, I would say just as an overarching um, idea to think about is I, I think every single university at this point needs a China task force of some kind where you bring in the faculty plus development, plus legal, plus there are so many China issues, everything ranging from espionage to, I saw Sheena Grines had a question about donations. Um, there's a lot of China activity going on and it's all delicate and it needs to be handled properly. And you need people in the room with a range of expertise, including China expertise. Um, but someone like me, I'm not in STEM, so it would be helpful for me to be engaging more directly with people in, in STEM for them to inform my ideas. And so I would like to see that type of institution put in place at different, um, at all universities, or at least all universities with substantial China presence. Um, and I think you see hints of that happening. And I, I've been pleased with my own university about how um, some of the discussions I've been about some China issues of late but I think that needs to be institutionalized. So I'm hopeful that Maggie and Mary will also want to weigh on this, but um, you did mention Sheena had asked a question and I had thought of Sheena's question as connected to Tom's as well. So I think I want to um, read Sheena's question to add it to the question that Tom um, posed and then see if Maggie and Mary want to speak to one or both of them. And Sheena, of course, is also a member of our project um, and we'll be speaking on a webinar, I think the last one before the election on technology on October 30th. So Sheena, uh, congratulates you all. Terrific set of remarks, relevant and constructive. Um, can you all speak to the issue of Chinese donations to universities, which has been debated a lot in the think tank world? I don't think the think tanks are debating Chinese donations to um, universities, but donations to the think tanks. Um, how should universities approach this issue? What, if anything, do individual faculty have to do with that process? or how might they monitor and impact it to protect broader campus academic freedom? I can try to answer that um, first. So my impression um, regarding this question is that universities should already have very robust institutions to um, prevent donors, which who are often alums, but not always, um, to dictate the academic enterprise that they are giving money to, if it is academic and not say football, which I think at Michigan gets more money than academics sometimes. Um, and, those, and those institutions should work just as well for Chinese alum as they do for American alums. And that um, my, my impression and my experience actually being an administrator is that those institutions and, and, and kind of norms as well as, as rules can work really, really well you have to manage expectations um, because I think donors often expect that they will have some influence. Um, but there should be, you know, very robust institutions and norms that are already in place, and those should work just as well for um, for Chinese alums or donors as they do for for others. Uh, reporting is also obviously really important, um, particularly around um, the the China factor, and so. That's, we should do more of that. And this is related to Rory's um, remarks earlier about the increase of universities use of say conflict of commitment and conflict of interest forms. Those are also, I think, been you know, strengthened because of all of these concerns. But absolutely, there, there, there already should be, be ways to combat that. So if Maggie, uh, if you don't want to weigh in, I, I can move on to uh, the next bucket of questions. Uh, and I'm mindful of time. So we're doing the best we can to get everything in. Um, if if uh, people are okay with it, maybe we could go five minutes over just to try to get as much uh, uh, here. And, and um, of course, everyone would love to continue having this dialogue in other forums as well. Um, so uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions um, that are actually coming from Penn colleagues uh, that is specific to the... Um, the question of Chinese uh, scholar and student associations. Uh, 
uh, and, and maybe also Confucius Institutes. Um, and so I'm, I'm combining a few different questions um, and including from uh, our senior colleague in this project, uh, Avery Goldstein. Um, so the first of these questions is, has to do with registration under the FARA, the, um, I forget the acronym, but you'll, you'll tell us, Mary, in, the, in, the, in your answer, the Agent Registration Act. Uh, looking at FARA, uh, CSSAs, the Chinese Student and Scholars Associations, do seem to fit the definition of entities to which it applies, but to avoid this being interpreted as singling out Chinese entities specifically, are there other student and scholar associations from other countries or nationalities, let's say Russia, Turkey, uh, who would also be covered by this recommendation as a matter of equal treatment. So that's one of those questions. Um, and then the second linked question, again, specific to CSSAs, uh, says um, many of these receive funding or financial assistance from embassy consulates, but they're mostly led by full-time students. Does it make these organizations foreign agents? Does it make students who are running these organizations foreign agents? If the answer is yes, if the students running these are foreign agents, then um, uh, is this proposal, is this approach going to put Chinese students in an even more difficult situation than they already are? Um, so to, for the first question um, on equal treatment, um, I didn't do really systematic research on CSSAs, but I looked at a bunch and then I also looked at some reporting and some uh, academic research. There's not much actually on, on the question. The um, Overwhelmingly, it seemed that this relationship and the, the funding structure is unusual. Uh, I didn't come across any other student organizations that uh, have ties to um, foreign embassies or consulates, but I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I wouldn't um, think, I mean, it could, could very well happen, in which case, yeah, equal treatment would be uh, important. I also want to point out that CSSAs vary uh, quite a bit in, in their bylaws and, in, and constitutions in how they discuss the, um, the affiliation and some don't discuss it at all. So there might be a way in which you could have some, some best practices that sort of make this unnecessary. Um, the, the most pernicious I think are CSSAs that talk about themselves as the official organization of Chinese student and scholars at, that, at said campus uh, and recognized both by the campus and by the consulate or embassy, which is actually, I think, incorrect because I don't think American universities recognize the official uh, organization in any case. But it, you know, what it says to Chinese students is that this is the official, the Guangfang uh, organization. Anything else is unofficial, perhaps independent, perhaps politically sensitive or dangerous. So I think that there could be some more oversight and, and perhaps more um, helping students adapt to best, best practices, so that's not um, necessary. On the other hand, if the Chinese embassy and consulates wants to maintain ties to students, you know, for safety reasons, for visa problems, for things like when a pandemic happens, they should be able to do so. But that, that should be separate, I think, from the student organization registered under the university. So I think I can squeeze in two more questions before we conclude here. Um, the first one uh, kind of connects to the, that theme, um, but I want to pose it uh, to Maggie uh, for reasons that will become apparent in a moment. Uh, this is a question from a colleague at USAID uh, who asks, how about supporting alternative Chinese language and cultural engagement at the high school level and below? Um, the Confucian Institute is working at this level, even elementary schools. We've been primarily thinking about universities, but the concern is that they're working at elementary schools. And, and the reason I'm asking Maggie for you to uh, speak to this is because then he asked, well, could we engage with Taiwan and other countries with substantial Chinese speaking populations uh, for our kids? Uh, no, that's a great, that's a great question. And, and obviously I, I started studying Chinese in high school in Madison, Wisconsin, and it was very unusual at that time. I mean, Japanese was, the thing to do. And, um, and being here in Taiwan, one thing I also find interesting is, is, is I'm 45 and there's not a lot of sort of China studies people in the United States in my 
age cohort who have spent significant time in Taiwan, who study Taiwan. I actually met Rory for the first time when he came to Taiwan with the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations because uh, the, we were the group that we went and did our language training in Beijing and went to China because it had opened up and it was much easier in the 90s to go there. And so Taiwan kind of lost um, some time and it lost a group of people from studying here. And now I'm seeing a lot of interest in coming back to Taiwan um, because it's um, a lovely place to live, but also it's academic freedom. I mean, I I'm always going places to hear people speak about whatever issue, you know, um, wrongful convictions and why the government's doing a terrible job, you know, whatever is happening with same sex marriage and the next, you know, constitutional court ruling. Um, and, and so I'm really, I, I think the issues that Mary has laid out about absence of information um, is, is not just on the university level. I am hesitant to have PRC government funding of Chinese language at any level because um, I have a five and an eight year old and, and trust me, they take in politics at this age too. So I, I do think it's not like Taiwan's a silver bullet, but I do think that we should look more at Taiwan, other places and just homegrown. We have a lot of resources in the US for a lot of language learning before someone gets very advanced, they can do that in the US and, and we're not doing enough to cultivate that. So let me, I think we just have time for one last question, which I think all three of you may be able to speak to. And it's a good question because I don't think we've really gotten into this so far because it focuses on visa policy. Um, and so maybe that's something that we could, it's a good way to conclude. How do you all feel about the Trump administration's visa policy proclamation from May of this year that targeted students and researchers affiliated with institutions involved in quote, military civil fusion? And more broadly, what's your perspective on the right approach um, to uh, visas for uh, Chinese students and scholars um, who want to study in the US? Um, I can take a first stab at that. I should say that the question asker is Rem Remco Zwaitslut, who is actually the authority on uh, US-China visa policies and does really excellent research at Georgetown at CSET Center for Security and Emerging Technology. So if you're interested in reading more about this issue, I would just look up Remco and uh, he's asking us a question that he already has probably an excellent answer to. Um, so what I would say is, uh, I think there, the use of that, I think that visa policy affected about 3,000 Chinese uh, PhD students. And I would say it's a, it's a blunt tool, right? So we know that it was based on ties to specific institutions that the U.S. government believes ha believe has ties to the Chinese military. But there's no evidence of specific wrongdoing on the part of those actual students. And so we're vilifying them based on their CV. And then the question is, all right, if that's the blunt tool, what is the more uh, precise tool that we can use? Um, for me, I, I would, again, I would say that we should make sure that students, when they come to the United States, that they, if they're, for example, receiving funding uh, from a university to do their PhD uh, in the United States, they should not be on the payroll of a Chinese entity of the Chinese military or anything like that. So at the very least, cutting, making sure they have no financial ties with Chinese counterparts, I think would be a start. But I'm, I'm in general hesitant for these sort of broad uh, visa, visa restrictions because I just think it, it probably hurts us more than it helps us. Um, I would just add to that that, and I, this is not really an area that I'm an expert in, but my sense is, is that using that um, targeted list um, may give, and, and I know that people wanted to do something um, you know, that was not so, so broad that you would catch a lot of universities. But I think it could also lead to sort of a false sense of security that somehow by, by only uh, honing in on, on these universities, uh, you probably miss actually lots of programs in Chinese universities that do uh, defense work or classified research. And that the, the US government, I, I, I'm, it's not clear to me that they have the information really to suss that out. And the way in which it was applied, it seems to me to give the State Department a lot of discretion, but a lot of discretion could also lead to a lot of error. So I, I, I'm not even sure it's an effective policy. And I, yeah, I would agree with that completely. And just anything that is cutting off connectivity, that is 
decreasing the ability to have interaction between the US and China, um, I, I am, I'm very wary about because there seems to be the sense that engagement has been conflated with somehow complicity or um, being sort of um, uh, not having a backbone and, and being pro-China, where, I mean, those of us who have been in meetings with counterparts in China know that we can disagree vehemently that interaction and engagement does not mean agreement, but it does mean that you get information, that you develop relationships. So when there are problems, you can try to have someone to contact who will help work through that in a constructive manner. And so the more we build walls, the more that we're going to be putting ourselves um, in a disadvantage, I think, in the long term. Great. Well, it's about 2 p.m. here in the U.S. It's about 2 a.m. for Maggie in Taiwan. So I think it's time for us to close the session. Thank you, all three of you, Mary, Rory, Maggie, for a really wonderful discussion. Thanks so much to the audience for tuning in and so many terrific questions. Um, again, we'll be releasing the video of today's discussion, as well as a summary of the findings and recommendations of our, our three speakers today on Tuesday. So keep an eye out for that. And please join us for the next webinar in this series on Friday of next week, same time, same place, uh, next week on the theme of human rights, law, and democracy. Till then, thank you all again for your support of our project on the future of US-China relations, and goodbye for now. <laughs>